So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, to start with, I'll be led by you. So, I mean, so you're here, which means you must have a sympathy for Extinction Oh, yeah, no, no, it's wonderful to see so many people who hadn't really done this sort of stuff before, especially so many new people, so many people from kind of backgrounds you usually don't get activists from, sort of small towns, rural, uh, and just so many young people, this sort of... I think that that it's a kind of a generational awakening that's starting to happen, and it's going to have to happen if we're going to save the planet. You know, yes. right? because I mean, people like me, by the time it gets really bad, we're going to be dead. You know, yes. I mean, we're just going to be just dead. Uh, but you know, the people, a lot of the people in high school now, I guess, well, they'll be in their 40s. You know. Um, I mean, they're looking forward and saying, what kind of life has uh, people left them? And, 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 you know, they have a reason to be angry. I mean, in fact, in a way, if I were them, I'd be a lot more angry than that, uh, they seem to be. I mean, they, I, I, in a way, the generation that I come from is quite possibly the most irresponsible ever to, to exist upon the earth. I mean, it's just astounding what kind of rubble and disaster they left in their way. My gen well, our generation, I can't believe the lack of embarrassment. Well, exactly. About exactly, and that's what they seem to have cultivated. It reminds me of when I was in Madagascar. Uh, at one point, they were talking about homelessness and poverty, and I was explaining the homelessness problem in places like New York and London, and they were like, oh, come on. You know, there can't really be. And I would say, no, no, it's a big problem. They were like, and the first reaction they had is like, well, we're, you know, we're a poor country. Aren't you guys embarrassed to go out in the world? Like, you can't even take care of your own people? I mean, yes. where's the shame? Yes. And, and they were just shocked. And, you know, and it was a good question. I thought about it. It's like, well, what are the mechanisms that have to be produced to make people not feel embarrassed by, by what they've done to destroy the planet, by, like, leaving, you know, their own fellow citizens to die on the streets? I mean, yes. you know, just think of all the enormous amount of of moral and intellectual work that has to be done to make it even possible for people not to be ashamed of themselves. Mm. Do, do you have optimism, though, that this could actually be the beginning of a turning point? I think, think so, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that, that we do only have a few years to turn this around, and essentially what people have come to realize is that the political class is completely useless. Yes. I mean, these people are useless in a thousand different ways. Yes. Uh, the very idea of vision and states, you know, being a sort of statesman is this completely gone. Um, yes. I mean, I actually pointed Obama as, a, in a way, being the ultimate the ultimate symbol of what's happened to us. He's a guy who managed to become president by acting like the kind of guy who would have a vision, you know? Yes. <laughs> he acted like, but it never even occurred to anybody to ask what his vision actually was yes, <laughs> because exactly. he didn't have one. Nobody has one. It was considered impossible to have a vision. Visions have been like completely out, you know, ruled out since the 70s or 80s. He was the, he was the <laughs> ultimate man. Manager, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. His vision was basically not to have a vision, yes. but he managed to sell that as a vision, just as close to a vision as you can have. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, can you? Do you have any idea on where where this could be going? Do you? you yes. know? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's two levels here. There's a creation of a kind of a. a sometimes called constituent power, of, of a sort of counter power to yeah. the existing political structure. And that has to be created on an ongoing basis to provide continual pressure on them. And there's also the threat of delegitimation. And I think that people underestimate the degree to which the most effective way of compelling politicians to actually do something um, is 
not to like come up with a list of specific things you want them to do and then enter the political process. And we got this all the time at Occupy. They were like, well, you know, where's your list? You've got to enter the political process and try to convince me. Um, but, you know, the, the most effective social movements are not ones that did that. Yes. Uh, I always point to Argentina in 2000, 2001, after the collapse there. Um, you know, their slogan was, que se vayan todos, they can all go to hell. The hell with the political class. These people are useless. Um, we're always going to carry on as if they don't exist. Yes. Uh, to hell with them. And, and um, in effect, it got to the point, and this is always a critical point, it got to the point where politicians couldn't even go to restaurants without wearing disguises and you know, <laughs> phony mustaches and hats over their eyes. You know, these people would throw food at them. And politicians of any political party. You know, the entire political class was so completely delegitimated. And people created popular assemblies, alternative economic, alternative currency systems, co you know, worker, workers took over factories. I mean, they just create, they just, just let's just carry on about these guys. So they had to do something uh, to re-legitimate themselves. So Kirchner, who came in as like the most moderate social democrat ever, um, you know, came into power. He had to do something. So he, he, he like rejected the IMF deal that was offered him and, and was the very first major country to, tell the IMF to go to hell, yeah. and like it essentially set off a cascade of, of further events that then ended the third world debt crisis. That's how it happened. Yes. And it happened not because people came up with a program saying, end the third world debt crisis by saying, fuck you to the IMF. It happened because you know people just rejected the political class and said, prove to us that you're in any way relevant to our lives. So we were forced to do so. And in a way, that's what's happening now. I mean, we are trying to ride on this deal yeah. Legitimation. The politicians are right now, you know, doing everything they can to reinforce the sense that they yes. are just entirely useless. Yes. Uh, they can't get anything done. Even stupid things that they promise to do, they can't do. Um, and um, you know, so so we're just pushing that along. So we have to set up a permanent counterpower, and we have use that force for legitimation to uh, delegitimation to drive an immediate response that can send them to the crisis mode where they really ought to be in. Um, you know, if they don't see a crisis, we'll have to create a crisis for them. Yes. Yeah. Millions of people, in fact, most people actually are doing that. And most people are already defaulting on some debt or well, other. Exactly. So they no are choice. practicing civil disobedience against finance capital. Yeah. yeah. And, and surely we've got to a, such a, a, a position of debt saturation yeah. that this is only going to get worse. So yeah. Because the only answer the political class have to uh, the position is to actually try to make more debt available right. or enable people to take on more debt. Right, well, it's just insane. And actually, the, the level of private indebtedness in the UK right now is uh, the highest it's been since right before the 2008 crash. And actually, it's a slightly higher. And there's only two different times in all of British history that we know that private, the private sector, household sector as a whole was in deficit rather than in surplus. And that war was now and right before 2008. So, um, you know, it, there's more of it. It's le slightly less securitized, but there's more of it than there was. Yes. So um, it, it would be insanely foolish for the people running the system not to see this as a potential crisis of the making. The thing is, debt also ble um, squeezes the economy, so it, it squeezes all of the productivity out of the economy. All right. I mean, and that's yeah. where we're at at the moment. We don't produce enough wealth to actually service the debt. Well, exactly. I mean, there's also the sectoral balance issues. That, yes. You know, if you have enough, um, you know, if the government's trying to kill off its own debt, um, and you don't have corporate investment, if the cor corporations aren't going to debt, in the moment they're just saving money, um, well, it's got to it's got to go somewhere. You can't finance it all from the balance of trade stuff. I mean, they're trying, but you know, the rest of it has to be made up precisely by, by private debt. So yes. it's, it's exactly the opposite of the way they try to tell you it works. Yes. You have this fantasy that, well, if the government balances its budget, that's somehow going to magically make it easier for you to do so. But exactly the opposite is true. And so far as the government balances its budget, you can't. Well, actually, it's worse <laughs> than that because the government took on basically the, the financial sector's debt yeah. and has now responded by foisting that debt onto private people. So the right. sectoral balances have been right. a transfer ultimately from the banking sector to us. Exactly. And, and then as it forces it on to private 
households, well, you know, where that gets distributed has nothing to do with morality, as they like to put it. It has to do with power. Yes. Uh, the richer you are, the more you ability you have to deflect it onto people who are less politically powerful. Yes. You know, what people don't understand, a lot of very basic stuff like this. Taxes is the one that I always point out. We have a deep misunderstanding of taxes. People assume that taxes are necessary for governments, you know, to get revenues to run their operations. But this yes. isn't really true. Um, you know, because they can just print the money and give it to themselves. And in a lot of ways, they actually do that. Yes. Um, um, you know, taxes exist to redistribute money. I mean, this is what the Gilets Jaunes figured out in France. Uh, and uh, that, that you know, they're the people who have the means to actually get their hands on this money that's being produced through the credit system, the people who don't. And the tax system is basically the way of just redistributing money up and down the system. Yes. That's why they basically give you all this money and then take it away again. So you have this illusion that there's something that's sort of naturally there that they're har harvesting, that people can all feel indignant about the government. But what the government's simply doing is, is a, a series of different interests sort of negotiating who gets what slice of the total pie. Yes. The tax system does that for us. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to you more about that, but I'm just aware <laughs> yeah. I'm taking up so much of your time.